This episode is sponsored by Hunt a Killer. Become a member and start solving murders from the comfort of your own home. What is going on, my fellow mythology nerds? My name is John Solo, and I don't know if you've noticed, but it's been a while since we've talked about the Olympians. That's partly because I've had so much fun exploring the mythos behind lesser known deities and figures, but also because the Olympians I have left are all pretty intimidating. Poseidon, Apollo, Hestia, Demeter, these aren't gods you wanna misrepresent, but the most terrifying of them all has to be the star of today's episode, Artemis. For those who aren't familiar with Artemis, how dare you? She is the goddess of the hunt, and you will show her the respect she deserves by learning everything there is to know about her. Just kidding, but it's not an exaggeration to say that's how Artemis conducts herself whenever she feels disrespected. She might have the shortest views of all the goddesses, and I'm including Hera in that assessment. Don't get me wrong, sometimes her reactions and the ensuing punishment for the offender are justified, but as you'll learn in this episode, she takes out her wrath on quite a few undeserving people. Honestly, with how vicious she can be, I'm a little surprised that Artemis is so popular among my fellow mythology nerds, but with how underrepresented she's been in pop culture so far, usually being relegated to a back background character, or quite literally a talking head, I understand the push to get her in the spotlight. Well, here you go, Artemis fans. The spotlight has arrived. Just please don't get mad at me when you reach the inevitable conclusion that she's done more to be considered a villain than Hades has. Before we dive into the Huntress's mythology, though, I want to say thanks to one of my all-time favorite sponsors that I've actually missed working with, Hunt a Killer. We may be learning about the goddess of the hunt today, but it goes without saying that hunting animals is not for everyone. Some of them are just too cute. Hunting killers though, everyone can get on board with that, cause even the cute ones are ugly. And that's where Hunt a Killer comes in. It's a murder mystery box where you and your friends are thrown into an ongoing murder investigation. And it's your job to examine clues, solve puzzles, and sift through case files to find the person responsible. There's a new season every six months, and with every season comes a new murder and a new story that you get to experience like you're actually a character in the universe. You'll meet the suspects, learn about the relationships to the victim, and ultimately decide which one is the culprit. Speaking from experience, these are incredibly engaging stories to be immersed in, and by the end, you'll find yourself both loving and hating the characters involved, depending on how guilty they are, of course. If you were to sign up right now, your job would be to solve the murder of a famous 1930s actress after her rotting remains are found in an old theater. If a mystery like that doesn't make your next game night, date night, or family reunion more interesting, I don't know what will. So pick up your next excuse to get the gang together and join Hunt a Killer. A membership can be as low as $25 a month and you can use code SOLO to get 20% off your first box. Now, unlike the past few figures we've talked about on Mythology Explained, there is no shortage of written material on Artemis. She was a very popular and well-respected deity in the days of the Greeks and Romans. As a result, there's actually several options for where I could start this breakdown, but I think the best choice is the very beginning, her birth. Naturally, there is a number of variations of this story, but for once, they all agree on her parentage. Artemis is the daughter of Zeus and the Titanus Leto, who presided over motherhood. We don't know much else about Leto, but we are certain their affair took place sometime after Zeus and Hera were married, because when Hera found out that yet another Titanus was having Zeus's child, she put a truly evil curse on her. After Leto went into labor, she found herself unable to give birth on the mainland, any islands, really any place under the sun, so she walked walked the earth for days, enduring the pains of childbirth, looking for somewhere safe to have her babies. Eventually, Poseidon felt so bad for Leto that he made the island of Delos float above the sea so she could give birth there without breaking any of Hera's rules, and I'm happy to say the plan was successful. Under the cool shade of an olive tree, she gave birth to her daughter Artemis, who, according to some versions, aged about six years on the first day and went on to be the midwife for her mother while she gave birth to her twin brother Apollo. We still have to do an episode about him and his journey becoming the god of the sun, but our focus today remains on Artemis, who had a pretty clear idea of who she wanted to be from a very young age. According to Callimachus's hymn to Artemis, it wasn't long after she could walk and talk that she took it upon herself to sit on Zeus's knee and give him a list of demands. She told them she wanted to be the goddess of the hunt. She wanted a new bow. She wanted her own hunting dogs and a retinue of nymphs and naiads to attend to her at all times. And most importantly, she never wanted to be married. 
Well, Zeus obviously couldn't say no to his adorable little girl, so he granted every one of her wishes, but it was still up to Artemis to retrieve her gifts. She had to visit Hephaestus and the Cyclopes herself to retrieve her silver bow and golden arrows. She got her seven hunting dogs from Pan, the god of nature, and even captured four golden horned deer by hand to pull her golden chariot. She would have had five deer, but Hera intervened and let one get away, and it would go on to one day be Heracles' third labor to catch it. What's funny about that is that when the day comes, Heracles puts in a ton of effort not to hurt the deer and chases it for an entire year before finally deciding to shoot it and as soon as he does, Artemis shows up to yell at him. She initially wants to punish him for his sin, but Heracles says he's only acting under the orders of the Oracle, so technically it's not his fault. Then Artemis sees his point, so she relents and heals the deer of its wounds. Anyway, the rest of Callimachus' hymn covers Artemis practicing shooting with her new bow, recruiting the 80 nymphs that would go on to be her entourage, and ascending to Olympus where she establishes once and for all that she is the goddess of the hunt. Now I've obviously put a lot of emphasis on Artemis being the hunting goddess, but that's actually not all she presides over, though much of her domain is still related. She was also the goddess of fishing and fowling, wild animals, wilderness, lakes and marshes, hunting bows and spears, nets and traps, and of course, animal pelts. But like many of the female goddesses, she also presided over some more feminine spaces, chastity, child delivery, nursing infants, girl children, the singing and dancing of maidens, as well as disease and the health of women. Also similar to her brother Apollo, who was the god of the sun, Artemis was the goddess of the moon. But try not to get these two confused with Helios and Selene, who personified the sun and moon. That's a totally different thing. As you can see, Artemis ruled over some pretty important aspects of human life. Hunting, one of our primary methods of food gathering at that time, and childbirth, our chosen strategy for not dying out. As a result, she was worshipped all over Greece in a variety of different ways. For example, in Sparta, they would make blood sacrifices to her before starting a new military campaign, usually by the soldiers kneeling in front of her altar and allowing themselves to be whipped. But in other cities, they sacrificed different things to her. In Arcadia, it was mainly fish. In Thrace, it was hunting dogs. And who could forget the festivals in her honor? There was one that took place every five years in Athens where girls between five and 10 would dress in saffron colored robes, put on bear masks, and act like bears. This was apparently their way of apologizing to the goddess after two Athenian men killed the bear that was sacred to her and she sent a plague to punish the city. Which actually transitions nicely to my next point, why did people sacrifice to Artemis? What exactly did they get out of it? Well, you can already see she hands out punishments like your mother hands out handy, so avoiding her wrath was essential. The people who pissed her off could expect illness to enter their life, to be killed during childbirth, have their daughters die unexpectedly, or even have their hunting parties cursed so they never bring back food. If you were in her favor though, you had it made. Your hunting and fishing trips were always successful, your children were born without incident, as long as you didn't piss off another goddess of childbirth, of course, and she would watch over your daughters to ensure they grew up healthy and strong. In fact, there was more than one occasion where a poor young maiden was being forced into a horrible situation and Artemis helped her out of it, like Princess Iphigenia, who was about to be sacrificed by her father, Agamemnon. The king had lied to his daughter, saying she was being summoned to marry the handsome and mighty warrior Achilles, but when she showed up, there was only a funeral pyre waiting for her. In some versions of the myth, Artemis intervenes after the pyre is lit up and replaces Iphigenia with a deer saving her life. Unfortunately though, it wasn't the way of the ancient Greeks to focus their myths on the blessings the gods gave because stories where everything works out just aren't as interesting and there isn't as much to learn from them. So let's dive into the most famous myths featuring Artemis and her wrath. One thing I want to be clear about for the sake of not pissing off any Artemis fans watching is that there are some myths where her fury is a good thing, and those myths usually entail her using her incredible abilities on the battlefield. For instance, during the Gigantamachi, when Hera had convinced the giants to try to dethrone Zeus and take over Olympus, every one of the gods ran away in fear except for Zeus, Apollo, Athena, and Artemis, who used her freakishly accurate bow and arrows to hold the attackers off. Another time, when Hera had ordered the giant Titio to try raping Leto, Artemis and Apollo showed up to defend their mother and just lit Titios up with arrows. That's not even the most painful part either. After he died, he was sent to Tartarus for daring to assault the deity, and there he would endure two vultures devouring his liver for eternity. But there were other occasions where Artemis was just plain wrong.
You have no idea how brave I am for saying that either. If she heard me, I'd probably have turned into a lizard. The reason I say she's wrong is because her punishments don't fit the crime. Take her assault on Adonis as an example. Depending on the version, the poor handsome lad was either just hunting in her territory or simply got caught in the middle of some drama between her and Aphrodite. Either way, the goddess wanted him to suffer, so she sent a wild boar to trample and disembowel him. Another hunter who suffered her wrath was Actaeon. This is one of her most infamous stories. He was a young prince from Thebes who, while on a hunting trip deep in the woods, happened to stumble upon Artemis and her nymphs while they were bathing. And to any lad saying he's a lucky guy, just wait. Because Artemis was a proud goddess, there weren't even any male gods allowed to see her naked, let alone mortal men. And right then and there, she decided Actaeon had to be punished. The poor guy tried to run away, but the magic of the gods isn't affected by any distance and with a simple snap of her fingers, the young prince started to transform into the very same animal he had trained his dogs to hunt mercilessly, a stag. Once again, Actaeon tried to outrun the danger, but it was no use. There were too many dogs and they were too well trained. They cornered their former master, sunk their razor sharp teeth deep into his flesh and proceeded to rip him apart limb from limb. Don't get me wrong, I don't think the guy should have been spying on a goddess in the shower, but whether it was intentional or an accident is up for debate, and being devoured by your own dogs because they don't realize you're you seems like some Ramsey Bolton sh**. The other guy who caught Artemis bathing, Cypriotes, didn't have it nearly as bad. She just turned him into a girl. Obviously, that's not ideal, especially if he was an ugly girl, but I'd rather go through that than have Gunther and Penny go insane and eat me. Contrary to the portrait I am painting so far though, Artemis did not only punish men. In fact, there was more than one occasion where she committed horrifying acts of vengeance on her loyal followers. A victim sort of similar to Actaeon is Callisto. She was an Arcadian princess who had taken a vow of chastity, but was later seduced by none other than Zeus. And because the fates have a sinister sense of humor, the princess wound up pregnant and had to hide her pregnancy from her patron goddess as long as she could. Eventually though, this became impossible. And one day while they were bathing, Artemis noticed that Callisto was with child. And to punish her for daring to break her vow, and lying about it, she turned her into a bear. The story gets worse though. As a bear, Callisto would go on to have her son who came out human. He then grew up to be a hunter and not knowing that his mother was a bear, almost killed her for wandering onto ground sacred to Zeus. At this point though, the God of Thunder finally decided he'd do something to make Callisto's life less of a living hell and saved her from death by turning her into the constellation that we know as Ursa Major, Great Bear. There's actually at least four conflicting versions of that myth all of which I have read and will definitely be doing a video on. The reason I'm telling you that now is because I know I'm going to get comments saying I quote unquote, forgot to mention that Zeus was in the form of Artemis when he seduced Callisto, which would make her punishment even more of a tragedy. But the problem with that version, as much as I prefer it, is the earliest record of it we found was told by an Athenian comedian. So there's probably not much truth to it. You know, as opposed to all the other versions, which are obviously true stories. Now, some of you watching might be thinking that's a bad example of Artemis acting unjustly. After all, Callisto made a sacred vow and broke it, so she had to know that repercussions were inevitable. And to that I'd say, fair enough. But have you heard the one about Niobe? She was a queen of Thebes who had given birth to and raised 14 children, a fact that she was extremely proud of, only she made the unforgivable mistake of saying it made her superior to Leto because she only had two children. Now, to be fair, if you survived going through labor 14 times in the days of ancient Greece, I think that should make you a goddess of motherhood by default, but Artemis and Apollo disagree. So you wanna know what they did? They paid Niobe's children a little visit. Using their almighty bow and arrows, Artemis slayed all seven of Niobe's daughters and Apollo murdered every one of her seven sons. In some versions, they spare a single daughter and son, but either way, I don't think Niobe deserved this. I mean, how many times have you said you were a god of something when you were feeling yourself just a little too much? Say you just demolished your rival team in a game of basketball. If you paid yourself a compliment, would you expect the god of basketball to come down and cave your skull in with a sick dunk? Of course not, but the real reason I made that comparison in the first place is just because I wanted to use this picture. Can you blame me? It's a masterpiece. I kinda wanna get it tattooed.
So it's already been established that Artemis is a virgin goddess and she demands the same purity from her loyal followers. But what if I told you there was a man who came real close to stealing the goddess's heart? He was a giant called Orion, the son of Poseidon. He was a hunting companion of hers and the two got along real swell. So swell that the goddess agreed to marry him. Not everyone was a fan of the relationship though, particularly Apollo who may have been jealous due to his infamously unsuccessful dating life early on. So get this, one day he approached Artemis and bet that she couldn't hit the small black thing that was floating in the ocean quite a distance away from them. And Artemis, being a proud goddess, immediately took out her bow and bullseyed it better than Luke Skywalker shooting a womp rat in his T-16. Only when the mysterious object floated the shore, she was horrified at what she saw, her soon-to-be husband's lifeless body with an arrow in the back of his head. Feeling both heartbroken and guilty over his death, she requested that Zeus grant him immortality, so he did, by turning him into a constant that we still know to this day as Orion. And while you may have heard a different version of Orion's death involving Gaia and a scorpion, just be patient. We'll be discussing that variant very soon in a certain other series. As for this episode, I feel like we've covered all the bases. So now it's time for me to ask the Artemis fans, what are your thoughts after hearing these stories? Are you at all put off by how merciless and vengeful she can be? Or is that part of the appeal for you? I'm genuinely curious, so let me know in a comment. Then if you made it to this point without liking or subscribing, can do that already. Think of it as a sacrifice to the algorithm gods if you have to. I need their blessings if I want people to watch this. Also, make sure you follow Gunther and I on the socials. Me, if you want to stay updated on Messed Up Origins news, which there is going to be a lot of over these next few months, or him if you like cute, small, mushy, fuzzy faces. Come on, how could someone not like that face? I'll see you all again next week when we dive headfirst into the pits of hell, the Norse kind, not the Christian kind. Until then, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first.